program. Analysis of the 2023 general election project plan launched by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, reveals that uh, while 189 billion naira was set aside for the 2019 elections, the 2023 election will gulp 305 billion naira, an increase of 115 billion naira, which translates to about 61.37% increase. With the Commission spending about 108 billion naira to conduct the 2015 general election, this placed the percentage difference between the 2015 and 2019 election at about 54.55%. With the increasing cost of elections in Nigeria, the polls, which oftentimes end up being marred by low voter registration and permanent voters card distribution, voter apathy, breakdown of law and order in select locations, widespread vote buying and selling, and even rigging the passage of the new Electoral Act is expected to breathe new life into election activities in Nigeria. With the country now having a robust framework to guide the conduct of elections that uh, conduct of elections what then is the cost of having credible elections in nigeria joining us to discuss this uh, is barrister festus okoye the INEC uh, national electoral commissioner for information and voter education uh, he joins us uh, virtually to talk about this thank you for joining us on daybreak this morning yeah, good morning. We have Agoso Bamei, a public affairs analyst uh, who joins us from Adamawa virtually uh, as well to talk about this. Thank you for joining us on Daybreak. Good morning. All right. Uh, well, let me begin with uh, Mr. Festus Okoye. We've seen a steady increase in the cost of running elections in the country. What are the uh, elements responsible for this uh, continuous increase? Well, uh, you know, the conduct of election is a very, very expensive uh, uh, venture. Uh, it's an indispensable public uh, investment. Um, and in Nigeria, uh, you have to also take into consideration uh, various uh, factors. Um, 26 years ago, uh, the total number of registered voters in Nigeria stood at um, uh, around 50 million. Uh, we went into the uh, 2019 general election with a total registered voter population of uh, 84 million. Now, our projection is that we are going to go into the 2023 general election with a projected uh, figure of uh, 100 million. And um, in relation to this, you have to also uh, uh, plan for them. Uh, prior to um, uh, during the 2019 general election, uh, the commission deployed to a total of 119,973 um, polling units. Uh, for the 2023 general election, uh, the commission is going to deploy to a, a total of uh, 176,846 uh, uh, polling units. Uh, so you have to take all these things into consideration uh, in looking at uh, uh, the figure we have. Uh, not, not only that, you will see that what the commission has done is to make sure that our election keeps on improving, uh, that voter confidence keeps on uh, 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 improve, improving. And for this particular period, what we have done is to have what we call a three-in-one device that we, that we can use uh, for our elections. Uh, during the voters' registration uh, exercise, we use what we call the IVED, that is the INEC voter enrollment device. Uh, for the purposes of um, uh, the election itself, for purposes of accreditation, we use what we call the BVAS, and then during result upload, we use the IREV. Now, this is one equipment that serves uh, multiple purposes, and this equipment, uh, this particular equipment, is, is very, very costly. Yes, it is true that we designed this equipment uh, in-house by our in-house engineers, but this equipment is fabricated uh, uh, outside the country. Uh, so we need at least 200,000 of these um, of, the, of the beavers uh, for the purposes of this, uh, this election. And uh, so if you look at it uh, uh, critically, you will see that um, in terms of this particular election, that this particular election is not as costly as the 2019 general election and it's not as costly as the 2015 uh, general election. You have to also look at 
where we are in terms of our currency. During the 2015 uh, election, the it was the dollar was uh, 165 dollars to the to the to the to the dollar. Uh, during the 2019 election, it was 365 naira to the dollar. During this period, we it is 565 uh, to the dollar. And so you have to take all these uh, variables into consideration in, um, uh, uh, in in quantifying whether there has been an increase in, in the cost of elections or whether there has really been a, a, a decrease. Uh, from our own projection, if you look at the average cost per voter, you will see that there has been a decrease in terms of the cost of elections in Nigeria. Less, regardless of the figures that we're seeing, isn't it? Yes, regardless of, regardless of the figures we are, uh, we are we are seeing. For instance, if if you look at it critically, if the uh, uh, we had the 165 naira to the dollar in 2015, and in 2019 we had 365 uh, uh, naira to the dollar, and then in 2022 we are having 565 uh, uh, naira to the dollar. Now this equipment, the beavers, has to be brought in from outside the country. It takes between six months and nine months. Uh, to fabricate th this equipment and bring them in. So something that you were getting at the cost of 165 to the dollar in, in 2015, you are now getting it at the cost of 565 uh, to the dollar in 2022. So if you put it uh, side by side, you will see uh, that uh, the variables are not um, really, really uh, atrocious. Okay, um, Mr. Festus, I'm aware that INEC has decided to increase the number of polling units. Uh, in the country. Don't you think that that also uh, is a factor that is contributing to this, you know, what we're seeing in the, in the figures? Now, if, if, if you look at the variables, you will see that there has not been any, any increase in the number of polling units. Now, because of the sheer number of, uh, of, of persons we had on the voters' register uh, during the 2019 uh, general election, the, and even in 2015, the commission decided to do to create what we call voting points and voting point settlements. When the polling units were created in Nigeria, uh, that is in 1996, Guarempa did not exist. Now, Guarempa is one of the biggest settlements in West, in West, in West Africa. So Guarempa, as a settlement, did not have even a single polling unit. So we had to create what we call voting point settlements uh, in Guarempa to enable them to cast their votes. Now, if you look at the Karu area, there's a particular uh, 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 um, polling unit that has almost 25,000 registered voters. So what we have done is to break those uh, 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 voting points and voting point settlements. The contest what I'm the saying is that what I'm saying is that whether that will have an implication on the cost, because you know, at the end of the day. Uh, when you have more polling units, it means now deploying more, you know, ad hoc officials there and more materials uh, to those polling units. No, what, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really have effect because what we did was to convert the existing voting points and voting point settlements into full-fledged polling units and then taking those voting points and voting point settlements out of the congested areas and taking them closer to the people uh, from uh, uh, where these congestions were created from. And so it really does not have a, an astronomic, uh, it doesn't have any serious effect on the cost because these voting points and voting point settlements, we are there already, already. They were there in 2019. The only thing we have done is to uh, convert them into full-fledged polling units. But each voting point had a full complement of a presiding officer and assistant presiding officers. Uh, so it, it didn't really uh, contribute much uh, to the cost. Okay, um, uh, that's a very good explanation by, uh, from Mr. Fessor Sokoye. Mr. Agoso, uh, are you there? Uh, okay, Mr. Agoso Bami, thank you very much for joining Daybreak on Trust Television this morning. Um, um, Mr. Okoye has explained how um, he has tried to justify the 305 billion naira that has been projected for the conduct of the 2023 elections. In your view, should Nigeria be spending so much on elections? Well, um... Elections are a necessary part of, uh, of uh, civil life and, and civil processes and civil governance. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we cannot do without them. And, and I also 
uh, agree with what he said earlier on, that elections are expensive. Uh, it's not uh, something that uh, you, can, you can get cheaply. Um, my worry about uh, the whole money that is going into this is um, the, uh, the security aspect of it, the human as well as the security aspect of, uh, of, of, the, of the elections. Because having gone through a series of elections from, 20, uh, from uh, 1999 to this point, um, it is, we expect as ordinary citizens of Nigeria that this time around, uh, not only will the processes work well, but also the lives of the, of the people, uh, the staff, INEC staff, and, and all those who are involved in the election, as well as the ordinary citizens who will go out and vote, uh, that their lives will be secured. Uh, to me, that is, uh, I, I, I'm more interested in that aspect uh, than, than in any, any, anything else. So I, I'm looking at a situation where um, we will come up with a, a, a better security system. And if, this, if part of this money is going into securing the elections, uh, not securing victory for any particular person, but securing the elections generally, that we go out that day, we vote on that day, uh, our votes are counted, and we return home safe, you know, and, and things do not, uh, things do not uh, get out of hand. And then uh, I think that the money is justified. I am concerned about this for, for two reasons. Uh, first reason is the security situation in the, in the, in the East, we know that there are people who are out and they are determined to make sure that elections do not hold in the East. And they have been displaying this by um, abducting uh, election staff and even killing some of them. Um, what will that be as we get closer to the general elections? Uh, will this be nipped or will it get out of hand? That's one concern. Uh, the second concern that I think that Nigerians should put their minds on is that the... Um, the parties, the political parties, uh, somehow appear to be throwing away the, uh, the zoning formula. Uh, even though the zoning formula is not constitutional, it's not in our constitution as, as, a, as a, it's not in our constitution as a country. Uh, but it, it has worked in, um, in in helping to douse the tension in the election, in the sense that when we come for election, uh, uh, the tensions are limited to one particular zone. And um, right now, the parties appear to want to throw it out, especially the, uh, the major opposition parties. Now, what will the reaction of those who think that this is their turn be? And I'm having in mind a, a Mr. scenario Bami. about... Mr. Yes, Bami, yes. Um, I'm looking at... Um, the, my, I'm particular about this cost on the electoral process. Part of the reasons this money is this huge is because oftentimes we have to spend so much to safeguard the ballot papers. We have to spend so much to protect the officials. We have to spend so much. In fact, in some areas where INEC offices were burnt, money will have to be spent to rebuild these offices. What is it that you think can be done so that all of this can be addressed and then that way will not be we will not have to spend so much taking care of those things. Uh, there, there are a number of things to me that I think uh, uh, we, we, will, we will have to do. Um, one is to work on the attitude of Nigerians generally, especially politicians, who consider elections as a do-or-die affair. And when they see that um, the indicators are not working in their favor, uh, then that's when you have this kind of situation that you just mentioned. Um, INEC offices are, are, are burned. Um, election materials are destroyed. Election uh, officials, uh, their lives are at stake, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we, we have to find a way of working on the attitude of politicians and Nigerians generally, that we accept the fact that elections are not a do-or-die affair. I mean, it's not an inheritance right. It's not a must that when you come out to run for office that you have to uh, be elected, that you have to win that election. Now, if we, if we get to a point where we see it like that and we, not, we approach it as a, either we win or we lose and we're ready to take it either way, and then we will have less of those uh, 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 destructions that uh, you mentioned. Another thing that we have to look at is the agitations in the, in the East because we, we have to still uh, look at that. 
Uh, my worry is that this, this might get out of hand. And uh, how do we get to a point before the general elections that we are able to get the people who are against elections in the East to back down so that there can be elections? And, and that way, we're not going to have the burnings we're talking about. We're not going to have the abductions. We're not going to have the, the, the killings that, uh, that we're talking about generally. And then, of course, uh, the, the third thing I would need to mention is the, the way the citizens perceive election officials, INEC officials and ad hoc staff. If they are seen to take one side, then, of course, you are going to have a reaction. So that impartiality that, that is clear and apparent and everybody can see it and, and be sure that they are working for the good of the elections, not for the good of the party in government, or for the good of any poli particular political party, then we will have less of those tensions. And then, of course, uh, the money has to go into the usual arrangement uh, for, for security to make sure that all these things are, are protected. But the main thing is the attitude of the politicians. That all is right. where we have problems all the time. All right. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Festus, uh, one of the other issues that we've seen in the past few weeks is this attack in Osu, where, you know, INEC officials were attacked and, you know, the continuous voter registration had to be suspended uh, in that area. So uh, what are the options, you know, that INEC is considering as regards uh, that place? And, and I'm sure that there are other areas uh, there too, you know, in, in the southeastern part of the country. What are the options in, in order to ensure that uh, people in those places are not disenfranchised? Well, uh, as, as you are aware, uh, the Commission suspended the further uh, voter registration exercise in Osu local government of Imo State. We also suspended same in Ninjaba local government, and we also suspended same in Hitubama local government area of um, uh, Imo State. In the rest of the local governments, uh, we are conducting the voters registration exercise in our state and local government offices. Uh, we have also done the same thing uh, for uh, Anna, Anna Ambra State in all the places we roll back to our state and local government offices. Now, we also have some frontline local governments in various parts of the country, in places like Sokoto, in, in Kasena, in Zamfara, uh, where we are not really doing the voters' registration exercise, except in our local government uh, offices and our state offices. Uh, so there are, there are places where we have um, as, uh, significant problems. Uh, in the next few days, um, immediately after the Salah uh, um, uh, break, uh, the commission we have we hold what we call the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security, uh, and we also hold a consultative meeting with political parties, uh, civil society groups, and all and, and and the media, and further review the security situation in the country, and then see how well we are doing with the devolution of. Uh, uh, the voters' registration uh, to the registration areas or what you call centers. Uh, because what we have done is to devolve uh, to the wards on a, on a rotational basis so that more people can get to register so that we can take this thing closer to the, uh, uh, to the people. But I, I, I believe that um, uh, uh, security is um, key uh, to all the things we are doing. And we expect the security agencies to be on top of their game. We expect the security agencies to provide adequate security for the voters and provide adequate security for our staff and also for our, our, our equipment. But more fundamentally, I think that we must continue uh, to find ways and means of building trust in our electoral process. And every critical stakeholder in the country uh, must come together, join, to, join hands together uh, to make sure that we give our people enough confidence uh, that whatever challenges they have, whatever grievances they have, that those grievances can be put on the table and that we can discuss as, 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 a, as a nation. And also find um, common solutions to our diversity, find common solutions uh, to our challenges. That is what other nations do. Okay, now, beyond the engagement uh, between INEC and the security officials, you know, I understand that there is this constant uh, deliberations and meetings between uh, INEC and the security officials. But beyond that, uh, some of the key players in this process is the politicians themselves. And INEC has, you know, some sort of uh, direct, you know, engagement with, with these politicians. What other uh, methods or what other things can INEC do in order to ensure that they put a check on some of these politicians, 
uh, such that they don't perpetrate uh, electoral offenses uh, and then, you know, related issues? The commission will continue to engage with the political parties. But you must also understand that our remit is to organize, undertake, and supervise elections. Our remit is to conduct civic and voter education. And our remit, remit is to register voters and also register political parties and also provide a clear framework uh, for the conduct of election. The task of securing the nation is uh, domiciled in a different agency of, of government. But more fundamentally, I, be, I believe that the, you cannot aspire to political power in order to rule uh, people who are in disarray, in order to rule uh, people who are angry, in order to govern uh, people who uh, are more concerned about their safety and about their, about their security. So we have a joint responsibility, it's a multi-stakeholder venture, uh, to make sure that we create a conducive atmosphere that we guarantee peace and stability. So the politicians who are canvassing for political power, who are all, of, all over the place seeking for domination, also have a responsibility to make sure that they do not do anything uh, that is extra, extrajudicial, that they do not do anything that is not in consonance with the Constitution, and that they assist the government, assist uh, the Commission, and also assist the Nigerian people in making sure that we have peace and stability in the country. So the politicians have a responsibility in this regard. Uh, the Commission will not go out of its way uh, to go and be buying uh, additional powers and additional responsibilities that have not been given to it. Um, Mr. Bami, are you still there? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm here. The more I keep listening to Mr. Okoye, the more I understand the, the, all the things that needs to be done ahead of the elections. But again, a lot of Nigerians are thinking that with the attitude of many politicians and some parties where uh, candidates are imposed, where, where their voices, their votes uh, sometimes do not count, they, they think that um, this money that is being spent on elections is too much, that they are paying, uh, they are paying too much for democracy. Do you think so? Yeah, I, I, I think so, I, I have to say. I, I, I really think so. If you look at the results we get for the money we spend, uh, then we, 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 it's a necessary process, but we're not getting the kind of results that will... Uh, lead us as a country uh, on the path of development and, and stability. So if you look at the results we've been getting for, for the elections, whether at the national level, state, or at the local government level, um, uh, Nigeria... Okay, it looks like... Uh, we lost, uh, we lost our goal, so we'll get back to him. Uh, we'll get back to him shortly. But I would like for uh, Mr. Festus to also talk about, you know, the cost of running elections and the commensurable results that Nigeria is getting. Do you think that this is also maybe part of the reasons why we are experiencing the kind of voter apathy that we see in some places? And, you know, it's indeed a big issue, isn't it? How can we restore confidence in the voters to know that they are you know, their votes will count at the end of the day after the stress, after the sacrifices that goes into uh, planning for elections and, you know, them going out to vote. Let, let, let me segregate your question. The issue of the cost of elections and the issue of voter party and the trust confidence, uh, uh, trust deficit in the electoral process. Now, if you look at the cost of elections uh, critically, and you look at the average cost per voter, which is universally accepted. During the 2015 election, the average cost per voter in Nigeria was $9.62. During the 2019 election, it was $7.38. And then for the 2023 election, the average cost will be $5.39. So you can see that we have not really gone out of our way in terms of uh, uh, making sure that we increase the average cost per, per voter. Now, if you also look at the international standards, in advanced countries, the average cost per voter revolves around $1 uh, to $3. In what we call transitional societies, the average cost per voter for an election is between $4 and $8 while in post-conflict societies, is between $9 and above. So you can see that even in Nigeria, we have kept it at a very, very 
a minimal level. If you look at Ghana, Ghana conducted the election in 2020, and the average cost per voter in Ghana was uh, was uh, seven point seventy dollars. Uh, I mean, seven point seventy dollars. So I think that we have kept this thing uh, 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 within an acceptable limit. Now, in terms of the issue of voter apathy, the commission has done what it believes it can do to increase voter confidence in the electoral process. One, we have converted uh, our uh, our voting points and voting point settlements into full-fledged polling units, and then taking the congested the existing polling units and also taking these uh, polling units uh, closer to the people is so that persons with disability can access the polling units um, easily. The elderly can do that. Lactating mothers can do that. So we have done that. Not only that, we have also imputed technology into our electoral process to obviate pernicious human interference in our electoral process. So we have uh, a, a, a more modern means of voter accreditation, we have more modern means of voter enrollment, and we also have a more modern gadget with which we do uh, uh, result, result uploads. And we have also made sure that we keep political parties uh, up to date with what we are doing. We have engaged and engaged properly. And even in terms of uh, uh, um, their voter nomination processes, we have also inputted technology in the nomination processes. We've inputted technology into the accreditation of, um, of um, domestic observers and, and even the media. So what we have done and what we will continue to do is to increase the confidence of our people in the electoral process. But as you know, no voter wants to go to the polling unit and go and die. No voter wants to go to the polling unit and go and get maimed. So we have to continue to engage the security agencies in terms of providing top-notch security uh, for the voters and also for our uh, ad hoc staff and for our, and for our equipment. In, during that number of election, I do you recollect, some parents insisted that their sons and daughters will not participate as ad hoc staff. And what do you expect? Somebody who has only a son, who serves as a son and, and as a daughter, will not want to go and lose such a person on the basis of the 17,500 naira that the commission pays uh, 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 such an ad hoc, ad hoc staff. So the politicians must resolve, as a, uh, uh, resolve that they are not going to do anything that will create confusion at the polling units, that will create an atmosphere of, of tension and chaos at the polling units. So if the politicians resolve to play by the rules of the game, the voters will have more confidence uh, to approach the polling units. But in terms of our own processes and, and our procedures, I believe that Nigerian people are beginning to re-engage the, pol the political process because they believe now that there's a possibility that they can go to the polling units and vote and their votes will count. And so we'll continue to work for the Nigerian people and we don't have a choice in that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bamey, I think we have Mr. Bamey back on the line. Okay, Mr. Bamey. Yeah, Yes, before before the little hitch there, you were. To, I asked a question: Are Nigerians getting value for this money that is being spent? Is the country not spending too much on democracy? But the the, the answer I, I, I gave and, and which I will still uh, emphasize is that, is, is that no, I'm, I'm one of those who feel that we're not getting value for, and not for. Not for, not for any shortcomings on the side of INEC. I must say here that INEC is, uh, is doing its best and it keeps on working to improve the process so that it can be as seamless as possible and so that Nigerians can, can benefit from it. It's, the problem is on the side of the politicians. It is the politicians, their, 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 their body language to their followers, uh, those who go out of their way to pay thugs, uh, to buy drugs, for thugs, to arm thugs, you know, to get out there and, and, and steal uh, 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 ballot papers and disrupt uh, elections in voting uh, units, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and go out there and, and cause mayhem. That is where the problem is. And that is what I meant when I said Nigerians are not getting value for it. The other aspect is after elections, the dividends of democracy, the dividends of governance, the kind of people who come into governance at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, uh, the kind of results they produce uh, for us ordinary Nigerians, we feel that uh, we're not getting value for the money that uh, we're, we're putting into elections. So that is where we have to look at, and that is what we need to work on, so that 
politicians will not do the things that result in uh, violence during or after elections. They also, when they come into office and settle down, work for the people to up uplift the living standards of the people. Then the people will feel that uh, they're not spending too much you know, in, 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 in elections, that, uh, that they are getting value for, for their investment in, in elections. Now, when, when you buy something expensive and you take it home and you read the uh, user manual and all the warranty that is in there and you get the exact or even more result uh, uh, from what, what you are told that you will get, then you will not complain. The, the, the okay. is nothing. Um, to when you talk about, about uh, the politicians after winning the election, they come into the office, and sometimes we don't get results for, from the, the kind of leadership they give. Uh, can, is there a way, can you tie that to the beginning, the processes? For instance, the nomination forms. Now we have um, a nomination form going for as much as 100 million. Do you think that that can have impact on the kind of leadership that we'll have at the end of the day? It has. It has an impact, and it's a negative impact. The truth of the matter is that the kind of people we need to lead us cannot afford uh, in a large extent, there may be one or two of them who can afford to buy uh, those uh, nomination forms at, at the current expenses. The other thing is uh, the culture of imposition in the political party, uh, godfatherism. Uh, if, if you do not belong to a particular caucus, if you do not belong to a particular club of politicians, no matter how good you are, you may understand the economy, you may understand the processes of economy, you may understand governance. And so if you are in office, you will produce results that will uplift the living standards of the people. But because you do not belong, you do not belong to uh, uh, those uh, clubs uh, within the political party, they will make sure you do not win, win elections. So from, from the word go, from the nomination and the processes that lead to primaries in the political party, uh, we, we, we lose the quality of leadership we are going to get. Because what we have on ground right now will not give us the best. So, um, okay, so in a couple of months, Nigerians will be going back to the polls. What can they do differently to ensure that this 305 billion taxpayers' money that is going to be spent on this exercise actually translates into something different? I think we, we have to interrogate the, uh, the candidate more rigorously. We don't just accept a candidate because he's been uh, sponsored by a certain political party that you have affiliations with, or that your father has affiliations with, or that your tribe has affiliations with. We have to find out their track records individually. We also have to find out uh, their manifesto. What do they want to do? We also have to find out their capability, and this time vote on the abilities of the people. Not because they come from a particular region or because they come from a particular political party. Nigerians need to be more involved. We need to be more deliberate in interrogating the candidates, in finding out who they are, where have they been, what have they done, what have they achieved, what are their abilities, what can they do for us? Are they independent-minded or will they be controlled by the political parties that sponsor them? Can they stand okay. up for what is right? All right. All right. I'm going to throw this to Mr. S uh, Mr. Festus. Uh, there's a new electoral law in place now. Uh, however, some sections of that uh, electoral law has been caught up uh, in litigation. And uh, there are expectations on some political appointees to resign to vie for certain uh, political offices. Now, with these litigations that we are seeing, uh, is INA going to now put that aside, put down the new Electoral Act uh, aside, uh, and then w w are we likely to see implementation uh, on the provisions of that uh, Electoral Act, given that there are some political appointees are, are yet to resign? Well, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the litigation reports around uh, uh, section 84, subsection 12 uh, of the Electoral Act 2022, and no, not uh, on other provisions. Uh, the Electoral Act 2022 
uh, has been assented to by the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Uh, so it is the extant law in relation uh, to um, the procedures and processes uh, for elections in, in Nigeria. Uh, so political parties are expected and, uh, uh, to abide by the provisions of the, of the, electoral, of the electoral Act uh, 2022 in everything they do in terms of their nomination processes. Uh, for instance, uh, Section 82 of the Electoral Act uh, makes it mandatory for political parties to give the Commission a, a 21 days notice of their intention to conduct party primaries. It is mandatory, and any political party that does not give uh, the Commission that particular notice, the implication is that that Commission uh, has not conducted or is not conducting uh, party primaries. Uh, the Electoral Act also says that political parties must conduct valid party primaries. The implication is that any political party that does not conduct valid party primaries is not expected uh, to submit uh, the list and personal particulars of any candidate uh, to the Independent National Electoral Commission. The commission has also given a band within which uh, political parties must uh, conduct their party primaries and conclude their party primaries. Any political party that goes outside that particular band set by the commission, the implication is that that particular political party will not be expected to submit the list and personal particulars uh, of, his, uh, of any candidate uh, to the Independent National Electoral Commission. Uh, so the Electoral Act 2022 uh, is in place, and political parties are expected to comply with the intentions and the spirit of the Electoral Act. If there's a challenge in relation to one particular provision, my advice to the political parties has always been to err on the side of caution, uh, because the matters are subjudice and they're still in court. Uh, so if you go against the provisions of, the, of, 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 of this particular section 84, subsection 12, and then at the end of the day, the Supreme Court affirms the validity uh, uh, and legality of that particular provision, the implication is that the whole candidate nominations you have done will come to nothing. The implication is that you will not have a candidate in the election. So why not err on the part of caution uh, rather than a on the on the on the side of um, a destructive electoral process. So uh, will INEC be willing to uh, pursue this matter in court? You know, regarding that section uh, of the uh, electoral act. Well, the section basically and fundamentally has nothing to do with the Independent National Electoral Commission. It has everything to do with the nomination processes um, uh, and procedures of the various. Um, of the, various political, uh, of the various political parties. There are issues and, uh, 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 and uh, provisions in the Electoral Act where the law expects the commission to act. And there are also the ones that uh, aspirants are supposed to activate the processes and procedures of the course in order, to, um, in order to activate. For instance, if a political party goes outside the band within which we set for the conduct of party primaries, we are not going to co collect any list submitted by that particular uh, political party. Uh, but if, for instance, a political party that does, does not uh, conform to its guidelines and regulations in the conduct of its primaries, the law expects aspirants in, the, in that particular context to activate the processes and procedures of the court in order to um, uh, seek redress. And so there are aspects that we can enforce, and there are aspects uh, that the courts must uh, give the go-ahead uh, before we can uh, enforce them. Okay, uh, Mr. Bame. Mr. Bame. Yes, okay, I'm here. Um, I just, we just listened to Mr. Okoye where he was talking about this uh, uh, particular section of the Constitution, which says that uh, people holding appointments should resign before they take part in the primaries. And we know that at the moment some people have indicated interest, but they have not resigned. And like INEC has said, that if at the end of the day this, this particular section stands, that could cause a lot of, um, you know, there could be, it will amount to a nullity. And if that happens, then another process will begin, thereby um, adding more to the cost of elections in Nigeria. What do you say to that? It's, it's part of the, uh, the attitude of politicians that we're talking about. I mean, in, in normal, under normal circumstances, when you know that there is a law requiring that uh, if you hold a public office and then uh, uh, you are interested in running for office, within a certain period you are to uh, vacate that office uh, before running, uh, uh, before before uh, showing your interest for for running for a political office, 
uh, the normal thing to do is to is to follow the law, resign. Why are they still holding the office and they're insisting on running? It's the attitude that we keep talking about. Nigerians have a bad attitude towards the law, and that keeps coming back to give us all kinds of pro problems. You could look ahead into the future and see that there will be a legal problem for this election coming out of this particular provision. They are, they are expected by law to have resigned. They have not. And it's going to create problems for us. It's the attitude that we have at, in this country as Nigerians, really. I mean, that's the law. So follow the law. Why are you not following it? That's a question that ordinary Nigerians should be asking. Why are they not following the provisions of the law to create legal uh, bottlenecks for us going down the road? In, in your and view, like, that, uh, uh, like Einek has said, it's good to, it's important or better to err on the side of caution. So why do you think they're actually holding on to their positions, even though they know there is a possibility anything could happen? That, that's, a, that's a mystery, really. That's something I really do not understand. Because for me as a person, if I am interested in an, is, uh, to run for a particular office, and I already hold a public office, and I know that by law I'm required to resign. I will resign. There's, there's no two way about it. I will resign. The one who win all, the one who still stay in office, have the benefit of office, and and then run run for run for office again and win. It's it's uh, to me. I, I think that part of the thing is that uh, they want to use political office. They want to use political office to ensure they win elections. Because, for instance, if you are a sitting governor and you go into elections, uh, then you have government machinery available to you to manipulate the process so that you win the election. I guess that is part of the reason why they are still staying in, in office. But as, as far as it goes, it is illegal because the law requires that you resign first and then show your interest. Right. So again, I, I have to repeat. All right, now, uh, let, let's talk, uh, Mr. Festus, uh, let's talk about, you know, the level of preparedness of INEC as regards the equity and Oshun uh, of circular election that is coming up uh, shortly. So what, what's the status as we know it now? Yes, uh, just, just, just permit me to clarify uh, one, one particular issue, and I think it's very, very germane and it's very, very important. If, if you look at Section 84, subsection 12 of the Electoral Act, he says no political appointee at any level shall be a voting delegate or be voted for at the convention or congress of any political party for the purpose of the nomination of candidates for any election. Now, the lawmakers went ahead immediately thereafter in section 84, subsection 13 to say that we are a political party. The emphasis here is on the political party. He says we are a political party fails to comply with the provisions of this act in the conduct of these primaries. Each candidate for election shall not be included in the election for the particular position in issue. So what the law is saying is that political parties must do due diligence and make sure that all their candidates conform and remain within the ambit of the law and the constitution in the in their emergence and also in terms of their credentials. And that at the end of the day, any political party that fails to comply, that it is that political party that will be the loser because it will not have candidate for that particular position for which it failed to comply. And that was why I kept on saying that political parties should err on the side of caution rather than um, doing something that will also lead to increase in the cost of elections and also lead to... Um, uh, it not having any candidate in relation uh, to the election. Now, in relation to the Oshun uh, and the equity governorship elections that will come up soon, uh, the commission is prepar preparing and preparing well. As of today, we have all these uh, non-sensitive materials required for the conduct of um, the equity governorship elections. So all of them have already gone to the states, and they, uh, very soon they'll be moving to the various um, uh, local governments. We have almost completed harvesting the ad hoc staff that will be uh, involved in this particular election. And then the models for their training and every other thing required for their training uh, is, re is, is already in place. Uh, this, the, the beavers that will be used for, the, uh, for voter accreditation is already in place. We have uh, a sufficient quantity. Uh, our staff have been trained, and we are very confident that the beavers uh, will perform uh, optimally. Uh, so in relation to the 
a kitty and national governorship election, uh, elections. We are confident that we are going to uh, conduct a good election. So we don't have any challenges in relation to that. In, immediately after the Salah festivities, uh, after the Salah break, uh, the uh, chairman and the national commissioners will embark on what we call readiness assessment of these two states to look at the level of our preparations, look at our offices, and to make sure that we motivate the staff uh, to do the right things uh, in relation to the election. So we are good to go in relation to the two elections. Okay, uh, to conclude this whole discussion, at the end of the day, if uh, viewers are not registered voters, they cannot participate uh, in the whole process. So. Uh, we are aware that the, the, there's, there's a date for ending the registration. So what's the update, as we know, uh, so far as regards the continual voter registration? Well, uh, Nigerians are now moving, moving and moving to go and, and register uh, because we have moved the registration to the registration areas on a, on a, on a, on a rotational basis. Uh, the cutoff date is 30th day of June uh, 2022, and we are confident that um, uh, more Nigerians will get themselves on the voters' roll. And you have to realize that this voters' registration has been going on since June last year for over, over, nine, over nine months, and that a particular period, it has to be brought to an end uh, so that we can clean up the voters' register. We need to do claims and objections. We need to also print the permanent voters' cards of the of the registrants and also give the political parties a copy a certified true copy of the voters uh, a, a register uh, to prepare them for the uh, for the for the election and so um in terms of this voters registration we have accelerated the processes all our resident electoral commissioners uh, the electoral officers are out there in the field engaging the stakeholders mobilizing uh, people and sensitizing them uh, to go out and get their, their, name, their names on the voters roll. And Nigerians are responding. Uh, but we do not want a surge uh, towards the uh, terminal period of this particular voters registration exercise. That's why we are encouraging people to go and register now, rather than um, uh, uh, we having a surge when it's just uh, one week to the terminal period. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us on Daybreak uh, this morning and sharing with us these updates and your perspectives on uh, the issues of elections in Nigeria. Thank you again.